The Life of Dwight L. Moody, Chapter 14, Influence of Henry Morehouse, a new epoch in Mr. Moody's religious experience in preaching, was marked by his friendship with Henry Morehouse. The acquaintance he made in Dublin during his first short visit to Great Britain seems to have been but casual. I had read in the papers about the boy preacher, said Mr. Moody, in relating the circumstances of his meeting with Morehouse, but I did not know that this was he. He introduced himself to me and said he would like to come to Chicago to preach. He was a beardless boy. He didn't look more than 17. And I said to myself, he can't preach. He wanted me to let him know what boat I was going to America on, as he would like to go on the boat with me. Well, I thought he couldn't preach, and I didn't let him know. I hadn't been in Chicago a great many weeks before I got a letter saying that he had arrived in America and that he would come to Chicago and preach for me if I wanted him. Well, I sat down and wrote a very cold letter. If you come west, call on me. I thought that would be the last I should hear of him. I soon got another letter saying he was still in the country and would come to Chicago and preach for me if I wanted him. I wrote him, if you happen to come west, drop in on me. In the course of a few days, I got a letter stating that on a certain Thursday he would be in Chicago and would preach for me. Then what to do with him, I didn't know. I had made up my mind that he couldn't preach. I was going to be out of town Thursday and Friday and told some of the officers of the church, there is an Englishman coming here Thursday who wants to preach. I don't know whether he can or not. They said there was a great deal of interest in the church and they did not think he had better preach them. He was a stranger, and he might do more harm than good. Well, I said, you might try him. I will announce him to speak Thursday night. Your regular week weekly meeting is on Friday. After hearing him, you can, either give, you can either announce that he will speak again the next night, or you can have your usual prayer meeting. If he speaks well both nights, you will know whether to announce him or me for the Sunday meetings. I will be back Saturday. When I got back Saturday morning, I was anxious to know how he got on. The first thing I said to my wife when I got to the house was, How is the young Englishman coming along? How do the people like him? They like him very much. Did you hear him? Yes. Well, what did you think of him? Did you like him? Yes, I liked him very much. He has preached two sermons from that verse of John, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I think you will like him, although he preaches a little differently from you. How is that? Well, he tells the worst sinners that God loves them. Then, said I, he is wrong. I think you will agree with him when you hear him. And she said she, because he backs up everything he says with the Bible. Sunday came, and I went to the church. I noticed that every one brought his Bible. The morning address was to Christians. I had never heard anything quite like it. He gave chapter and verse to prove every statement he made. When night came, the church was packed. Now, beloved friends, said the preacher, if you will turn to the third chapter of John, the 16th verse, you will find my text. He preached the most extraordinary sermon from that verse. He did not divide the text into secondly and thirdly and fourthly. He just took the whole verse and then went through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelations, to prove that in all ages God loved the world. God had sent prophets and patriarchs and holy men to warn us, and then he sent his son, and after they killed him, he sent the Holy Ghost. I never knew up to that time that God loved us so much. This heart of mine began to thaw out. I could not keep back the tears. It was like news from a far country. I just drank it in. So did the crowded congregation. I tell you, there is one thing that draws above everything else in this world, and that is love. A man that has no one to love him, no mother, no wife, no children, no brother, no sister, belongs to the class that commits suicide. It's pretty hard to get a crowd out in Chicago on Monday night, but the people can. They brought their Bibles, and Morehouse began. Beloved friends, if you will turn to the third chapter of John, in the 16th verse, you will find my text. And again he showed on another line from Genesis to Revelation that God loved us. He could turn to almost any part of the Bible and prove it. Well, I thought that 
That was better than the other one. He struck a higher note than ever, and it was sweet to my soul to hear it. He just beat that truth down into my heart, and I have never doubted it since. I used to preach that God was behind the sinner with a double-edged sword ready to hew him down. I have got done with that. I preach now that God is behind him with love, and he is running away from the God of love. Tuesday night came, and we thought we had, he had surely exhausted the text, that he would take another. But he said, if you will turn to the third chapter of John, and the sixteenth verse, you will find my text. And he preached again from that wonderful text. And this night, he seemed to strike a higher chord still. God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have. Not going to have when you die, but have it right now eternal life. By th that time, we began to believe it, and we have never doubted it since. For six months, he had preached on that one text. This, for six nights, he had preached on that one text. The seventh night came, and he went into the pulpit. Every eye was on him. He said, Beloved friends, I have been hunting all day for a new text, but I cannot find anything so good as the old one. So we will go back to the third chapter of John in the 16th verse. And he preached the seventh sermon from those wonderful words, God so loved the world. I remember the end of that sermon. My friends, he said, for a whole week I have been trying to tell you how much God loves you. But I cannot do it with this poor stammering tongue. If I could borrow Jacob's ladder and climb up into heaven and ask Gabriel, who stands in the presence of the Almighty, to tell me how much love the Father has, for the world. All he could say would be, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If a man gets up in that pulpit and gives out that text today, there is a smile all over the church. Mr. Morehouse taught Moody to draw his sword full length, to fling the scabbard away, and enter the battle and then with the naked blade. The first visit to America was repeated in August 1868, when he again visited Chicago and labored with Mr. Moody for two months, preaching in his church and in Farewell Hall. During this time, accompanied by Mr. Moody, he went to various other cities, holding some 72 meetings. In the winter of 1872, he came again to America and conducted services in Chicago. And again, in 1878, he assisted Mr. Moody's evangelical work in a New England mission. Mr. Morehouse was among the first to welcome Moody to England in June 1875 and assisted him at Newcastle on Pine and other places, taking a leading part in his all-day meetings. The delighted recognition of each other's strength of character bound them closely together in a strong friendship. Mr. Morehouse's affectionate nature and devotion to the Master and Mr. Moody's strong common sense and ever-widening influence combined to make them irresistible companions in evangelistic work. <laughs>